Hey guys, welcome back. We're gonna continue with the book Automate the Boring Stuff and we're gonna cover chapter 2 Flow Control. You can find the book for free if you head over to automatetheboringstuff.com, that's the latest version, and we're gonna cover chapter 2. If you prefer a physical copy of the book, there's a link in the description down below. That's an affiliate link, it's at no extra cost to you, but if you purchase a book through that link, I will receive a small commission, so it really helps out the channel. Alright, let's jump right in. In the last video, we covered the very basics of working with Python, how to work with variables, for example, also how to use expressions in Python, and how to write our first programs. But those programs had a very linear structure, meaning they started at the very beginning, and then they went all the way through to the end without any deviation. And that's quite unusual. Typically, there will be some decision points to make within our program, and this is really where flow control comes in. And let's have a quick look at an example of what that could look like. Here's a control statement that we can see that corresponds to a flowchart. And this flowchart basically is based around the decision if it's raining and if it's raining, we should bring an umbrella. So here we have the starting point. And the first decision to make is to see if it's raining or not. And then based on that, we have either the option to say, yes, it's raining or no, it's not raining. If it's not raining, we can go outside and that's basically the end. But if it's raining, then we are checking if we have an umbrella. And if we do have an umbrella, then we can go outside safely. And again, that's the end of our flowchart. But if we don't have an umbrella, then we should wait and still check if it's raining. And if it's still raining, then again, we're going to wait. So we are basically going to wait as long as it's raining. And once it's not raining anymore, then we can go outside. And this kind of logic where we decide between yes or no, that's basically what we can do with flow control. Before we have a look at how we can actually structure that, let's first of all cover how we would represent those yes and no values in Python. And those are called Boolean values, and there are two different Boolean values, true or false, and that basically corresponds to yes and no. Let's have a look at a practical example and let's head over to our new editor. And again, we can open our REPL up. And let's have a look at a quick example. We learned last time how we can define a variable simply by providing a valid name and then the equal sign. And now we're going to learn about Boolean values, so true and false. So here I'm going to set spam to true. And if I type in spam, then I'm going to get back true. It's important to capitalize the T in true, otherwise that's not valid. So for instance, if I type in true with lowercase, we can already see that it's not green as up here. So if I type enter, we can see there's actually an error here, a name error, because true is not defined. If I type in true with a capital T, we can already see it turns green. And now true, of course, returns true. So that's important to note. And the same is, of course, true with false, the alternative value. We need to make sure that we capitalize it. There's also some operations that we can't do. So we can't assign a value to a Boolean value. So for example, this would be invalid. If we type in true and we try to set that to 2 plus 2, then we're going to get a syntax error because we cannot assign a value to true. Now we can type out true and false directly, but more often we're actually going to check an expression that we learned about in the previous video, and we're going to check if that evaluates to true or false. And to do that, we have a number of different comparison operators available to us. Let's have a quick look. So here we can see the different comparison operators that are provided in Python. These are six different ones. We have equals to, which is two equal sign. That's important. If we just use a single equal sign, that's assignment. As we saw before, if we define a variable, for example, two equal signs would mean we are actually checking if those expressions on both sides of the equal sign are actually equal. Then we have exclamation mark equals, which is not equal to. Then we have less than, greater than, less than or equal to, which is this less sign and then an equal sign. And then we have greater than or equal to, which is this greater sign and then an equal sign. So let's have a look at some examples. Let's say, for example, we want to check two values. In this case, again, it's important to use two equal signs, not a single one. And then we can check if 42 is equal to 42. 
that of course is true. We can also check something that would evaluate to false. So 42 is equal to 99, that of course returns false. And then we can also use other operators. For example, we could check if two is not equal to three, for example. So using this exclamation mark equal sign that evaluates to true because it's basically the reverse of the equals operator. So therefore this returns true. And then we can also check if two is not equal to two. So if you have a look at that, that of course returns false. And we can do the same, not just for numbers, for integer values in this case, but we can also do it for strings. So basically for text. So here we are checking if the string hello is equal to the string hello. And again, we get back true. But for strings, it's important to note that they are actually case sensitive when we compare that. So for example, if we compared hello in all lowercase letters to hello, which is capitalized, then we are going to get back false. So that's important to note. But of course, we can also do the same operations as we did with numbers before. So we could, for example, check if two strings are different using the exclamation mark equal sign. And that's going to evaluate. So in this case here, of course, this string dog is not equal to cat. So we get back true in this case. And we can even compare Boolean values. So we could check if true is equal to true, which of course is true. And we could check if true is not equal to false, which is also true. Important to note for numbers, we can compare integer numbers, so which are whole numbers, to floating point numbers, which are numbers that have a decimal point. So here we are checking if the integer 42 is equal to the float 42.0. And that's actually going to evaluate to true because both values here actually evaluate to 42. So therefore, this is true. But if we try to check if the integer 42 or the float 42 is equal to the string 42, those are of course different things. So if we run that, we are going to get back false. What we could do, of course, that we learned last time, we could use casting to turn that into an integer. And if we do that, the string 42 is going to be turned into the integer 42. And then those two expressions or those two values rather in this expression should be equal. So in this case, we are going to get back true. But if we compare a number to a string, that's not going to be the same. Now we just saw that if we compare integers to floating point numbers, for example, we compared 42 to 42.0, that evaluates to true. But that's not necessarily true for other operators that we are using. So we could, for example, compare if 42 is less than 100, which of course is true. We can also check the reverse if 42 is greater than 100, which of course is not true, so false. And we can also go ahead and use variables. So for example, we could say we have a variable called, let's say, egg count. We set that equal to 42. And then we check if egg count is less than or equal to 42. And that is also true. And if we type in my age, set that to a value, and then check if that's greater than or equal to 10, for example, that also evaluates to true. We saw before that we can use that equal and not equal operator with both numbers such as integers and floating point numbers and also strings. Uh, but if we have a look at other operators such as greater than or less than, that only works with numbers, so integers or floating point numbers, it's not going to work with string values. So let's have a look at an example. Let's say, for example, you want to check if 42 is less than 100, that evaluates to true. And by the way, you can always clear the screen by pressing on Control and L. And then we can check if 42 is greater than 100, which of course is going to return false. And of course, we can do the same with variables as we learned last time. We could, for example, have a variable called account. We're going to set that equal to 42. And now if we go ahead and we check if account is less than or equal to 42, that's going to check if it's equal to 42 or if it's less than 42, it's not less than 42, but it's equal to 42 and therefore we're going to get back true. And important to note, as mentioned before, there's a big difference between this here, the equals operator. So here we are checking if two numbers are the same. So for example, 42 is equal to 42, which is going to give us back return and the assignment operator. 
which we use, for example, when we define a variable. So if, for example, here we assign the value of 12 to spam. If we type in this, it's really unclear to the Python interpreter what should happen here, because we try to basically assign the value 42 here to what would be a variable 42, but as we learned last time, a variable cannot start with, with a number. So therefore, this is basically an invalid definition of a variable. So if we try to type this in, we get back the syntax error here that we cannot assign that to a literal. So here we always have to make sure that we use double equals. And that's, by the way, also part of the reason why variable names in Python cannot start with a number so that we avoid these kind of errors, because otherwise we basically would have a variable called 42, which can be very confusing. So we learned about the six different comparison operators, such as equals, greater than, greater than or equals, less than, less than and equals. There are also three different Boolean operators in Python that we can use. And those are and, or, and not. And they can be used to compare Boolean values. So let's have a look at them one at a time. And we are going to start with binary Boolean operators. And there we have two different ones. We have the end operator and the or operator. And they always take two Boolean values or expressions, and therefore they are considered binary operators because they are always two expressions that are being compared. And the end operator evaluates an expression to true if both Boolean values are true, and otherwise it evaluates to false. So to have a look at that, let's type in true and true. And we can either type in those Boolean values directly, such as true or false, or alternatively, we could use an expression. So if we type this in and we confirm, we can see true and true returns true. If instead we are having a look at true and false, this is going to give us back false because we expect both Boolean values here or both expressions to evaluate to true if we use the Boolean operator end. And to represent that, we can use what's called a truth table. So if we head back over to the book, we can have a look at the end operator's truth table. So here, basically, we have the different kinds of expressions that we are looking at, and we see what that evaluates to. So as we just saw, true and true is going to evaluate to true. True and false, as we saw, is going to evaluate to false. And then we have two other possible combinations. So false and true, which is basically this one here, just switched over, is going to evaluate to false. And of course, false and false will also evaluate to false. So only when both values of the expression are either Boolean values that are true, or are values that evaluate to true, only in that case, the entire expression is going to evaluate to true. So that's important to note. Now, of course, aside from using the end operator, we also have the or operator that we can work with. So in this case, only one of the two parts of the expressions has to be true. So if we say false or true, if you think back at the end operator, if we wrote out false and true, that would evaluate to false because part of the expression is false. But here, when we use the or operator, we are basically checking is false true or is true true. True, of course, is true. And therefore, the entire expression will evaluate to true. And basically, only if we type out false or false, and this is going to evaluate to false because the entire expression is basically false. So it's kind of flipped compared to the end operator's truth table. Here we only have one expression that's going to evaluate to true. If we have a look at the or operator's truth table, we can see three out of four expressions are going to evaluate to true, and only this one here is going to evaluate to false. Aside from the AND and OR operators, those binary operators, we have the third Boolean operator, the NOT operator. And unlike the AND and OR Boolean operator, the NOT operator operates on only one Boolean value OR expression. And this makes it a unary operator as opposed to a binary operator as we saw before. So that basically just flips around the Boolean value that's currently being assigned to an expression and turns it around. So if it's true, it's going to turn to false. And if it's false, it's going to turn to true. So let's make that a little bit more clear. So if we have, for example, a Boolean expression true, which of course is going to evaluate to true, if we now just write not true, 
then we're gonna get back false. And we could even say not not true. So not true would be false as we see here, but by typing not in front of it, that's going to turn it back to true. And then we could even change that longer. So if we say not 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 true, then again, we basically have this expression here, not not true, which values to true. We have a not in front of it. So that flips the Boolean value again, and therefore we get back false. So the Boolean table here is, is really quite simple. We just basically flip around the Boolean value that we have here. So if you have an expression that would be true, if we have not true, then that would evaluate to false. And if you have not false, that would evaluate to true. Now that may be quite abstract and you might be wondering why we're actually covering this. Um, that's going to become quite useful and let's have an example of how we would actually apply and use that. Because we can actually mix Boolean and comparison operators. So uh, let's have a look at a number of different expressions. We can use the comparison operators as before. So for example, we can check if 4 is less than 5, which of course would evaluate to true. And then we can combine that with the Boolean operator and and on the other side, we can check is if five is less than six, which is also true. So in this case here, four is less than five will evaluate to true and five is less than six. It's also going to evaluate to true. So we're checking if true and true. And if we think back, that of course will evaluate to true. However, if instead we have this expression, we are checking if four is less than five and nine is less than six, then the first part here is still gonna be true. So we're checking if true is true and nine is less than six, but this is false. And since we're using the end operator, we know that both sides of the expression have to be equal to true, or have to evaluate to true. So in this case, we're gonna get back false. And in such a case, the computer will evaluate the left expression first, so four is less than five. And then it will evaluate the right expression here, so nine is less than six. And when it knows the Boolean value for each, it will then evaluate the whole expression down to one boolean value and we can make this quite complicated if we want to so we could for example say the following so here for example we have a number of different comparison operators and also boolean operators first of all the expression on the very left side will be evaluated first so 2 plus 2 equals 4 which is equal to true next we're checking if 2 plus 2 is equal to 5 which is false but then we have that unary Boolean operator not. So therefore we are checking, we're basically flipping around the Boolean value here. So this was false, because, but because there's a not in front of it, it's gonna be turned into true. So this second part here will evaluate to true. And then if you have a look at two times two, of course it's four, so that's equal to two plus two. So therefore we have true and true and true. So the entire expression should evaluate to true. And Boolean operators, just like mass operators have a certain order of precedence. So what Python is going to do it is it's going to evaluate the unary operator not first before it's evaluating the on end operator here. So therefore this will basically be evaluated first before we are comparing this expression to the previous one. Flow control statements often start with a part called a condition and they're always followed by a block of code called the clause. So before we are going to have a look into Python specific flow control statements, we are going to cover what a condition and what a block actually is. So the Boolean expressions that we looked at, either with a comparison operator and or with the Boolean operators, could all be considered conditions, which are basically the same thing as expressions. Condition is just a more specific name in the context of flow control statements. And those conditions always evaluate down to a Boolean value, so either true or false. And basically almost every flow control statement uses as a condition. So if you think back at the very beginning, we had this decision to make whether or not we should go outside when it's raining. And those are basically different conditions that we are checking. Now lines of Python code can actually be grouped into what's called blocks. And in Python we can tell when a block begins and ends from the indentation of the lines of code. And there are three different rules for blocks. Blocks begin when the indentation increases. Blocks can contain other blocks, so they are nested inside of each other. And blocks end when the indentation decreases to zero or to a containings block indentation. So let's have a look at an example because that's going to make things a lot easier. And for that we can actually write out a little program. 
So let's have a look at this example here and it's for now not that important to understand um, all the syntax yet. We're gonna cover that in a bit. But we can see that we have different blocks that are being used. And the first block of code actually starts at the at the line print hello Mary. Uh, we, we can say that because it actually is indented here. So this would be the first block of code. And this first block of code basically includes all the lines after it because they have the same indentation level here. Then we have a second block, which is this print line here. Again, we can tell that because it's indented here. And then we have a third block of code, which is after this else here, it's also indented. And <clears throat> while this first block here covers basically all of these lines, so everything from line four to line eight of the second block here, but since that's not the case, it's basically just this one line. And then the third block here also has just a single line. The most common type of flow control statement is the if statement. And if we take a look, closer look at that, we can see that the if statement is always constructed in the same way. We first of all have the if keyword. Then we have a condition that either evaluates to true or false. Then we have a colon. And then we indent the next line and start a block of code. That's going to be executed if that condition evaluates to true. So here's a quick example. We have a variable called name that's equal to Alice. And then we are checking in the if statements condition if name is indeed equal to Alice. And if that's the case, we're going to print out hi Alice. And since that condition here values to true, of course, this is what's being printed out. We can also write an else statement. So the else statement always comes after the if statement and is executed if the if statement evaluates to false. So if name is not equal to Alice, then this else statement will be executed. Here's an example. The name is still set to Alice. So therefore, this is going to print out hi Alice. But if we now go ahead and we change the name variable, for example, to Mary, and we run our statement again after making that change, we can see that now name equals Alice evaluates to false, and therefore the else statement is executed. There's also a third keyword that can be used, which is called elif. So elif is similar to the else statement executed when the if statement evaluates to false, but we can have an additional condition. So here, for example, we are first of all checking if the name is equal to Alice. We set it to Mary, so that's going to be wrong. And then we are checking some other condition. So for example, we have a variable called age, and we are checking if age is less than 12. Since we set age to 10, that's true, and therefore this statement will be executed. And we can have more than one elif statement, so we could check for different other cases. And we can also combine the two, so we can first have an if statement, then a couple of elif statements, and at the end we could have an else statement, which basically covers all other cases. So here's one such example. We have an if statement, we have an elif statement, and we have an else statement. Specifically, we set name to be Carol and age to be 3000. And first we're checking if the name variable is equal to Alice, and if that's the case, we're going to print out hi Alice. Now in our case, we set name to be equal to Carol, so that's going to evaluate to false. And we are switching to the first elif condition. So we are checking if age is less than 12. That's also not true because we set age to be 3000. And then we have finally the else statement. If both of those conditions are wrong or any additional conditions, if we have more than one elif statement, then the else statement will be executed. And in this case, of course, the else statement is executed and this is being printed out. Now, if statements, else statements, and else statements are really useful if you want to branch our code and have different conditions and depending on the conditions, handle different cases. But what we can't do yet is the ability to loop over a certain section of the code a number of times, for example, to repeat something. And for that, we have the while loop available. The while loop is actually quite similar in terms of the structure to the if statement. If we have a look at this if statement here, we basically define a variable spam, which we set to zero. And then we are checking if spam is less than five, we're printing out hello world, and then we increase the value of spam by one. So if you run that, hello world will, will be printed out once. If you want to change that into a while loop, we basically just need to add the while statement here. And then we have that condition spam is less than five, the colon and the indented block. So here we are going to execute our code. 
until this condition here, spam is less than 5, evaluates to false. So basically whenever we reach the end of the block, we jump back to the beginning until that condition here evaluates to false. We start out by setting spam to 0. So spam is going to be 0, 0 is less than 5. So this statement is true and we are going to print out hello world and then we are going to increase spam by 1. So as we jump into the second iteration, spam is going to be 1, which is still less than 5, that's true. So we are going to print out hello world again. Now spam is going to be 2, 2 is less than 5, we print it out, we increase it to 3, 3 is less than 5, we print it out again. And then we increase it again to 4, 4 is less than 5, we print out hello world. And at that point we increase it to 5, and 5 is not less than 5, so therefore we stop the execution. So if we run our program, we can see that we go through the loop five times and each time we print out hello world. Let's have a look at another example. Here we have an annoying loop, so we define the name and set it equal to an empty string. And then we are checking if the name is not equal to the string your name. And then we ask the user to type in your name. And unless the user literally types in your name, this loop will keep on looping and asking for input and only when we type in your name will we actually break out of the loop and print thank you. So let's have a look at that. If we type any entry other than your name, the while loop will continue to loop and once we type in your name then we basically break out of the loop. It's also possible to directly write true in the condition of the while loop. So that means basically that the while loop will always evaluate to true. And to still ensure that we break out of the loop, we can use what's called a break statement. So when we encounter a break statement, then the execution of the loop will be stopped and we basically break out of the loop. So this is basically the same program as before, but instead of having the condition up here, inside the while loop, we instead have the condition while true and then we have an if statement that's checking if we typed in your name and then we break out. So let's check this one more time and we can see it's basically the same program as before but we wrote it slightly differently. One important thing to note here we should always make sure that our loop actually ends. So for example if we were to remove let's say those lines here and we just have this loop while true and there's no condition to ever stop that loop we will encounter an infinite loop. So as we run this program, you can see it always keeps on typing this print statement here. And it will basically continue to do that until we basically used up all the memory in our computer and then the program will basically crash. At this point, we can, however, press Control C and this is going to issue a keyboard interrupt and forcibly end the execution of our program. That can be quite useful if we encounter such an infinite loop, but we should generally always make sure that we don't run into an infinite loop. Aside from the break statement, we can also use the continue statement. The continue statement is kind of similar to the break statement, but it, there's a slight difference. So while the break statement breaks us out of the execution of the loop, as we saw before, the continue statement basically ends the execution of this particular iteration of the loop and then jumps back to the beginning. So if we encounter this continue statement, the rest of the while loop will be ignored and we jump back to the beginning. Let's have a look at this code. We are basically running a while loop that is set to be true. Then we print out who we are, who are you? We ask for the input and if the provided name is not equal to Joe, then we ask who are you again? So we jump back to the beginning of the program. And we continue doing that until we provide Joe as a name and then we continue execution of the program. We ask for a password and if the password is correct, then we break out of the loop. So let's have a look at this program and let's actually run it. So if I type in any name other than Joe, we are going to encounter that continuous statement and jump back to the beginning of the program. So everything else is ignored and we jump back to the beginning. If however the name is set to Joe, then this if statement here is not true, it's false, and therefore we ignore it and continue with the next print statement. So now we get this message here, hello Joe, what is the password? We need to enter the password here. So let's first of all take some random password. In that case, of course, the if statement is not true. That means we jump back to the beginning of the program and we are asked again who we are. Let's type in Joe. 
And let's type in the correct password here. And when we do that, we encounter the break statement, break out of the loop, and then have that print statement at the end. So that's the difference between the continue statement that just skips the execution of the current iteration of the loop and the break statement that breaks it out completely out of the while loop. Now, conditions that we encounter, for example, in our while loop or in the if statement, will consider some values in other data types equivalent to true and false. So for example, an empty string like this will evaluate to false and that's called falsy. And there are also values that evaluate to true, which is called truthy. So here, for example, we have that condition while not name for this while loop here. And we could write it as follows. We could write while not name is not equal to the empty string. And we could run the program. And if you press enter, we basically provide an empty string because here we have this input statement and we just press enter and that keeps us in the loop here. But instead of doing that, we can just remove the last part here because the empty string will automatically evaluate to false. So basically when we press enter here, the same thing is gonna happen. We stay inside of the loop because again, the empty string is a falsy value and therefore evaluates to false automatically without having a special condition assigned to it. And we have another example of a falsy value here. So number of guests, the number zero or 0, 0.0, for example, if you think about float numbers, will also evaluate to false. And therefore this if statement will evaluate to false. Let's have a look at an example. So I type in my name and then I can provide the number of guests, for example, 12. And that of course is going to execute this statement. But if I run the program again and I type in my name and I just press zero and enter, you can see that the if statement is never executed. And that's because the number zero also evaluates to false. It's also a falsy value. And basically all other values, so except for the empty string, the number zero, or for float number 0, 0.0, all of those evaluate to true. So those are truthy values. Now while loops are going to execute until some condition is false. And they're great whenever we don't know how often a certain loop should be iterated. So whenever we need to check for a certain condition, then while loops are a really good choice. But if you already know how many times a program should be executed, how many times a loop should run, then there's a better option. We can use a for loop. And a for loop is typically used in combination with a range function because that can tell us how many times we want to run through a for loop. And a for loop is built in the following way. We have the for keyword, then we have a variable name, for example, i, but it could be any other value. Then we have the keyword in, and then we have the range function itself, and we pass a certain value to the range function. So in parentheses, we have an integer or up to three integers that we can pass to the range function. We have a colon, and then we indent the next line. And that basically means that for the variable i in the range, and by default, if you just enter one value, it's always from zero up to the value entered here. So from the range zero to five, we are going to execute this statement. So if you run this program, we can see that we actually run this program five times because on each iteration, the for loop will automatically increment, meaning increase the value of i by one. And we do that all the way from zero up to five. And therefore our statement is basically executed five times in total. And here we always print out on each iteration, Jimmy five times, and we pass the value i to it, which starts at zero. So that's the first iteration here. And then it always increases by one. So the range function here by default always starts at zero and goes up to the value, but not including the value provided here. We can also use the break and continue statements that we learned about before when using while loops inside of for loops that would work the same way. And we can use for loops for a number of useful cases. Let's have a look at another example. So here we have an example of another for loop. We start by setting a variable total to zero and then we loop over a range from zero all the way up to 101. That's exclusive. So we're going from zero to 100. 
and we have a variable this time we called it num it can really be called anything as long as it's a valid variable and then we take the total and we add num to it so what this basically does is on each iteration it basically adds the value of total and then adds the next value to it so we are basically adding up all the numbers from zero all the way up to 100. So if you run that we can see that it's up to 5050 so that's the result of running our program. We could of course run this and also the previous program as a while loop so if we wanted to do that we could just rewrite this and use a while loop instead. So the first for loop that we wrote was this jimmy five times program and this is basically the same code but written with a while loop here we have to take some additional steps, so specifically we need to set i to 0, we need to initialize it in the beginning. At the end of our while loop we need to increase i by 1. So this is something that happens basically automatically in the for loop statement. For example, when we write for i in range 5, that already includes the fact that i is set to 0 and that we increase i by 1 at the end of the statement, but here for the while loop we have to write it. And we get the same output, but the for statement is just a little bit more succinct. We have less code that we need to write. Now, as mentioned before, the for statement can actually take up to three different integer values as arguments to the function. And those are three different conditions. We have the start condition, the stop condition, and the step condition. And to make that a little bit more clear, let's actually take a look at some examples. So of course we could write for i in range five, for example, and then we say we are going to print i and that's going to print the value 0 all the way up to 4 so not including but up to that value 5 so that's the case we already looked at but instead of typing that we can also add a second value so for example we can provide a start value let's say 12 and then the ending value 16 if we don't add two values but just a single value then the start value will always be zero and the end value will be the provided one minus one so in this case we have a start value of 12 an ending value of 16 16 is exclusive so we're going all the way up to 15 so we should print out 12 13 14 and 15 which is exactly what we get back here so this is how we can set a start value and an end value and we can go one step further we can set our start value we can set our end value and then we can add a step value. So instead of just increasing it by one, we can set a different step value, for example, two. And so now we are going in step of twos. So zero, two, four, etc. So let's run that. And we can see indeed that we start at zero, we go up to, but not including to 10, and we go in steps of two. So zero, two, four, six, eight. Now the next step here would be 10 but that's exclusive so we stop here and those are the values we get back and this range function is quite flexible so we can even use negative values let's say for example we start at 5 we want to go all the way down to 0 so we type in minus 1 because it's always basically exclusive and then of course we want to go in negative steps so negative 1 and let's run the program here and we can see we start at 5, go down to 4, 3, 2, 1, and we stop at 0 because we define minus 1 that's exclusive, so we go back from 5 to 0. Now, especially when we later on get to the section where we're actually going to automate different steps, we are going to use existing code that we want to work on, and for that it's possible to import modules into Python. And a module is basically a library that contains existing functionalities and we can import existing libraries and existing modules into our program to use their functionality. So as an example, there is a module called random that is used to work with random numbers. And we can import that by just typing out import random and then we can use the random functionality inside of our code. So we don't have to basically rewrite the functionality of random but we can use the existing functionality. So here we're using the random module and we call the rand in function, which is part of the random module, and we pass in a value of one and 10. So what we are going to get back is a random integer number between one and 10. 
So if we run that, we are looping over it five times. So we get back one, four, ten, three, and nine on the first execution. Let's just try that again. And now we can see we get back other values. And those values are, are random. So that's a very easy and quick way how we can use random numbers into our program by just importing the random module. Now, because we can import those modules and those modules at the end of the day are just files, it's important that we don't overwrite those existing files. So if we write our own programs, we of course always provide a name to it, for example, hello.py. And it's important to not use certain names inside of our file names. So for example, we should not call it random.py because it would basically overwrite the random module if we were to use it in another program. Now, there are different ways actually of importing modules, one of which we already saw. If we use this approach, import, and then the module name, for example, random, we always have to use the name of the module, then a dot, and then the function we are looking at. There's another way to go about this. So we could, for example, say we want to import from the random module. So we say from random, we say import, and then we can either import some functionalities, for example, let's say the rent int function. And then we can remove the random function because it's clear that rent int is actually part of the random module. So if you run that again, it works just as before, but now we don't have to write random in front of it. And if there are other functions that we want to use inside of the random module, we can instead write from random import star. And star stands basically, or asterisk stands basically for everything inside of the random module. In this case, it's important that we don't use our own function called rent end because that would be a conflict. So therefore, sometimes it can be a bit better to actually write import random rather than using this approach. Now, another module that we can import is the sys module here, which includes a lot of system related functionalities. One of which is a exit function here, which allows us to exit a program at a certain point. So if we actually take this code here and we copy it, we can paste it inside of our idle REPL environment and we can press enter. And now whenever we type some kind of response, it's going to tell us you typed and then whatever we typed and we should type in exit to exit. And here we are checking for the response. And if the response is equal to exit, then we are calling sys.exit, which is a command to actually end the program. So let's type in exit. And now we can see we used system exit to actually exit out of our program. So that's not as relevant at the moment, but later on when we write our own programs where we can't easily use, for example, control C to break out of the program, then that's a really good way to end our program. Now, so far we looked at small programs to understand the concepts behind, for example, for loops or if statements, but uh, they were not quite that useful. So let's now take a look at actually two different examples of larger programs that are using what we have learned so far. So first of all, the first program we're looking at is a guess and number game. We are basically running a program, if we just start this right now, where we are guessing a number between one and 20. That number is random and we don't know that number. So let's say, for example, we are guessing 10, just the middle. In this case, I got lucky that it was indeed the number we were looking at, but let's just run that program again. And now if my guess is too high, the program is going to tell me that the guess is too high and then we should take another guess. So now I know my number that I'm looking for is between one and 10. So I'm going to type in five. And now I can see that my guess is still too high. So I'm going to type in three and now I found the number. And we can then see that we found the number in a certain number of guesses. It took us three guesses to get to the number. And this is basically how the program works. We start out by importing the random module, which of course allows us to generate a random number. And then we generate the secret number that we are looking for by using the random module, specifically the rent in function that we briefly saw before, and we are generating a random integer between one and 20. That is assigned to that variable. Now we print out that we are thinking of a number between one and 20, and then we ask the player to guess a certain number of times. So 
the player has six different guesses to guess the number and if they manage to guess the number in those six guesses then we print out good job and we tell them how many guesses it took them to get to that number. And if they don't manage to do that within the certain number of guesses then we print out that they didn't make it and what the actual number was. So to actually manage the guessing part we are using a for loop and we have a variable here called guesses taken and we start our range from 1 all the way up to 7. And 7 of course is exclusive so we go from 1 all the way up to 6. We first of all print out that we should take a guess. We are using the input function as before for the user to actually type in a number and since we expect a number input we then use the int cast here to turn that into an integer number. That is stored in the guess variable. And now we are checking if the guess is less than the secret number we generated before. If that's the case then we print out that our guess is too low. Elif, the guess is greater than the secret number then we print the guess is too high and else meaning the guess is equal to the secret number then we use the break statement here so we break out of the loop before we actually guessed six times. And after that loop so either when we broke out because we guessed the correct number or if the loop has ended because it ran six times we are then checking if the guess is equal to the secret number and if that's the case we're printing out good job otherwise we print no that's not correct. So that's one example of how we can use what we learned so far to actually write a useful program to write a guessing game. Let's take a look at another example and this program is a little bit larger. Here we are basically modeling a rock paper scissors game. So users should either say they are selecting rock paper or scissors uh, and then of course the computer would also select an option and we can see if we are winning, if we are losing or if we have a tie. And to actually write this we are using both the random module as before and also the sys module which is quite useful especially if you want to exit a program. Then we print out rock paper scissors. We set the number of wins, losses and ties all to zero. And then we have a while loop here which is the main game loop. As you can see there are some comments here that we added. And then we print out the number of wins, the number of losses and the number of ties. Next we have another loop that's nested inside of the main game loop which is the player input loop and we ask the player which kind of moves they want to take. Do they want to play rock, paper or scissors or do they want to quit? Then we get the input so if the user types in Q to quit then we use the exit function on the sys module to quit the program. If the player selects R for rock or the player selects P for paper or the player selects S for scissors, then we break out. So we break out of the player input loop and then we display what the player chose. And here at the end if the user types in anything else other than R, P, S or Q, then we stay inside of that loop and we tell the player that they should type in one of the available options here. Next we're going to display what the player chose. So if the player selects R, we print rock versus and the same for paper and scissors. And then of course we need to display what the computer chose. That's purely random. So here we're using the random module and inside of the random module we're using the randint function passing in a value between one, 1 and 3 whereas 1 corresponds to rock, 2 corresponds to paper and 3 corresponds to scissors. So the computer is randomly choosing one of those three options. And then of course we need to compare what we chose, what the computer chose and if we won, if we lost or if it's a tie. So if the player move is equal to the computer move then it's a tie and we increase the number of ties so we can keep track of how many ties we have and then we are checking if we selected rock and the computer selected scissors then since rock beats scissors we are winning and we increase the number of wins. If we selected paper and the computer selected rock then we win again because paper beats rock and we increase the number of wins. And also if we selected scissors and the computer selected paper we win again so the wins are increased but of course we can also lose. So if we select rock and the computer selects paper then rock loses to paper so we are losing and the losses are increased. If we select paper and the computer selected scissors 
then we lose again. And also if we select, select scissors and the computer selects rock, then we also lose. So let's have a look at how the program actually looks like. So here we are first printing out rock, paper, scissors. We have zero wins, zero losses and zero ties. You can see we are inside the main game loop here. This is what's being displayed. And this percent %s, by the way, is just a way to easily render the values that are displayed after that. So that's just a specific type of Python syntax. And then we are inside of this player input loop, so we are asked to enter our move. Let's say we select rock, so we type r, we press, press enter, and unfortunately it looks like the computer selected paper, so therefore we lose. And now we have one loss, zero wins, and zero ties. So next let's select something else. Let's select scissors, for example. And now we have a tie. So we selected scissors versus scissors. That's a computer selected. So at least it's better than a loss. Now let's just select paper. Again, we are in a tie. Let's select paper again. Again a tie. Okay, and finally we're winning because the computer selected rock. Of course, the selection on the computer side is completely random. So now we see we have one win, one loss and four ties. We can now quit our program by typing Q and this is going to trigger this sys.exit call here and so we can issue a system exit and exit out of the program. So this is quite complex, both the rock, paper, scissor game and the guess the number game. No need to be able to program something like that at this moment but uh, feel free to have a look at the program, play around with it. Of course all of that can be found on the website here on the Automate the Boring Stuff website, so the entire source code is available there. Now let's briefly recap what we covered in this chapter, that was quite a bit. We have learned that by using expressions that evaluate to either true or false, those are conditions, we can write programs that make decisions on what, what code to execute and what code to skip. We also learned that we can execute code over and over again by either using a while loop or a for loop. We covered the if statements, elif statements, and else statements. And we can also use another type of flow control by writing our own functions. And we're going to cover that in the next video. But let's first of all have a look at the practice questions. So here we are asked what are the two values of the Boolean data type and how do you write them? So we learned we have two different Boolean data types, true and false. And it's important that we capitalize that so both true and false false should start with a capital letter, otherwise Python doesn't really know how to handle this. The next question is, what are the three Boolean operators? So we learned about those three Boolean operators, and, or, and not. And and or are binary operators, because they always are used in conjunction with two separate values, so we have an expression. And then not is a unary operator, because that's just used in front of an existing value expression. So for example, if we have something like not false, that would evaluate true, true. The next question here asks us to write out truth tables for each Boolean operator. That is every possible combination of Boolean values for the operator and what they evaluate to. Now for practice, we could write this out, but we can also have a look at, for example, something like this. Uh, this is from Wikimedia. So we can basically say we have those th three different operators and or and not. And here we can see if we have A to be false, false, true and true and B to be false, true, false and true. A and B would be false unless both A and B are true. And if we use or instead as a Boolean operator, then only if both A and B are false, that's going to be false. In all other cases, it's going to be true because A or B basically means at least one of the two values of an expression has to be true. And then not A is of course just reversing the Boolean value here. So for example, not false would be true and not true would be false. So those are the three different operators here and the associated truth table. Now let's have a look what the following expressions evaluate to. 5 greater than 4 and 3 equals 5. Because we use the AND operator here, we know that both statements need to be true. And we can already tell that 3 is not equal to 5, therefore the entire expression will evaluate to false. And of course we could 
also double check any of those expressions. So if you switch over to our REPL here, we could just type this in and we can see indeed that it evaluates to false. So next we have a not 5 is greater than 4. 5 is greater than 4, that's true, but because of the not, it's going to be false. If we have the next one, or we know that only one of the two statements needs to be correct, so 5 greater than 4, that's already true, so we don't even have to evaluate this. This happens to be false, but since this one is true, we know that the entire statement is true, which is the case. And then we can have a look at this one here, 5 greater than 4, that's true. Or we don't, again, have to evaluate that because we know everything in here is going to be true because we have an OR statement. But then we have the NOT in front of it that reverses it, so instead of true, this entire expression will be false. So we can see here. And then we check true and true. Of course, that will be true. And true equals false. True equals false, of course, is false. So we have true and false, which will be false. And finally, we have not false, which will be true, of course. Or, and again, we don't really have to evaluate that because we already know this is true and we have an OR statement, so the entire expression will be true. But not true is false, so we have true or false. And that will be true, of course. So next we are asked, what are the six comparison operators? We know that's equal, it's not equal, it's greater than, less than, greater than or equal than, and less than or equal than. Now what's the difference between the equal to operator and the assignment operator? That's really important. So the equal to operator is basically those two equal signs. So we can, for example, check if three is equal to three. And the assignment operator, of course, we can't do this. That would be invalid. But instead we could, for example, say we want to assign a value variable and then we would use the single sign. So single equal signs for assignment and double equal signs for comparison. So we should explain what a condition is and where we would use one. So a condition is basically the same as an expression. So it would evaluate to true or false. So for example, we check if five is greater than three, for example, and uh, conditions are used inside of if statements or for example, elif statements also um, in conjunction with, for example, for loops or while loops. And those conditions then basically ensure whether a certain block of code that's basically enclosed by the if statement or the while loop, for example, is being executed or not. And that brings us to the next question here. We should identify three blocks in this code. We know that a block is always characterized by being indented in Python. So therefore, the first block that we see is actually the one here. So this entire section here is one block because after the if statement here, we indent the next part here. So this if statement here is the first block. And then we can see inside of this first block, we have an if statements here and another indentation. And this is the second block here. So if spam is greater than five, this part here will be executed and that is our block. And the third block is inside of the else statement here, also indented. So this is the third block here. So next we should write code that prints hello if one is stored in a variable spam. We should print howdy if two is stored in spam. And we should print greetings if anything else is stored in spam. So we already know we need to check if a variable spam is equal to one, two, or anything else. So we are using an if statement, elif statement, and else statement. And we can write that as follows. We have our variable spam, which I just set to one for now. And then we are checking if spam is equal to one. We are going to print hello. Elif spam is equal to two. We are printing howdy. And in any other case, we are printing greetings. So in this case, of course, we print hello. But if we were to change it to, let's say five, then the else statement here would be triggered and we would print out greetings. What keys can we press if we are stuck in an infinite loop? We learned before that we can press control C to break out of an infinite loop. Now, what's the difference between a break and a continue statement. Of course, the break statement is going to break us out of the entire loop that we are in, for example, the while loop or the for loop. And the continue statement is just skipping over the current iteration of the loop and it will jump to the beginning of the loop again. What is the difference between range 10, range 0 to 10, range 0, 10, 1 in a for loop? 
It's a bit of a trick question because the output should be exactly the same because by default, if we don't provide any starting value, the starting value will be equal to zero and 10 is the ending value here. So not exclusive, zero up to, but not including 10. Range zero, 10 is therefore the same. And by default, we also have a step size of one. So therefore all three should be the same. We could of course verify that. So here we have um, in our REPL a simple statement for i in range 10, print i. So if we run that, we can see we print out the numbers from zero to nine. And if we change that to zero to 10, if we run that again, we get the same output here. And again, if we change that to zero, 10, one, we still get the same output. So in such a case, it's best to just simply write range 10 because the other values are the default values that are being used. Next, we should write a short program that prints the numbers one to 10 using a for loop. And then we should print an equivalent program that prints the numbers one to 10 using a while loop. So first of all, we have our for loop here. We write for i in range one to 11. Again, the upper bound is exclusive. So if you want to go from one to 10, we have to write one comma 11. And then we simply write print i. So those are just two lines. Now, if we run the program, we can see we are printing out the numbers from one all the way up to 10. We can change that to a while loop. Here we're basically saying we have a variable called i, which we set to one. Then we say while i is less than 11, we're going to print i, and then we are going to increase i by one. So let's run this program. And we can see we get the same output, but we can see we, it took us four lines to write this while loop, while it only took us two lines to write the for loop. So the for loop in this case would be better because we already know how many times we're going to run through our code. Now, if we had a function named bacon inside a module named spam, how would we call it after importing spam? So in that case, we would basically do the following. We would import spam. And then if our function is called bacon inside the module spam, we need to do the following. We need to type spam dot bacon. And this way we would call the function bacon inside of the spam module. Now, and finally, as some extra credit, we should look up the round and apps function on the internet and find out what they do. And we then we should experiment with them in the interactive shell. So actually we already looked up the round function last time, but just to briefly recap, we can head over to docs.python.org or really a lot of different pages that list some Python documentation. Here we're going to find some built-in functions. This page is pretty good because it's the official Python documentation. Here we can have a look and we can find the round function. And um, as we already covered in the last video, we can use it to round some numbers. So just to briefly recap, Let's head back to our editor and let's open the REPL here. And here we can round a number, let's say 5.4, for example, and that will be rounded to the next number. So if we change that to 5.7, it will be rounded to six. And we can also go ahead and if we have a longer number here, for example, round it to two digits after the decimal point, that will work just as well. Now, the other function we should look up is the ABS function here, which returns the absolute value of a number. So the argument here may be an integer or a floating point number, and then we can type in the value and that is going to give us the absolute number. So if we do that with a positive number, then of course we just get back that same number. But if we now say we want to cover a negative number, then it's going to give us the absolute of that negative number. That means the positive number. Um, so it's going to remove the negative sign basically. All right, that's it for this video. In the next video, we are going to cover functions in Python. So see you guys in the next video.